Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. We're going to read another one of these uh, amazing little lessons that Jesus gave to his disciples and to us. And as Paul said, it's our unusual privilege to have the freedom to just say whatever you want to do, Lord, and uh, watch him do it. But we're in number three, watchful, do your job, and we're going to read verses 45 to 51. And uh, out of uh, our desire to listen to the Lord, I, I shouldn't have you stand up and sit down, but do you mind? Can I have them? If they're able. If you're able, let's all stand together for the reading of God's word. Now, Ezra made them all stand the whole sermon, and it was six hours long. That was amazing, so I couldn't go that long. Here we go, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, just a casual reading of that has a bad ending, right? Wouldn't you agree? The bad servant has a bad ending. Let's, let's ask the Lord to help us be good servants. You may be seated. You've already prayed that. So let's think about what we're reading. Uh, this, the most frequent way that God describes us, it's interesting, are his servants. In fact, the whole Bible ends in Revelation 22 with only two things left, God and his servants. That's what heaven is, God and his servants. It's interesting, the word servant is a toned-down word. Uh, it's actually the word doulos, which is a bond slave, the, the most uh, disposable people in the world. In the Roman Empire, people were like uh, AA batteries. Used to be. I know we recycle them now. But it used to be when they weren't any good, you threw them in the trash, right? Nobody saved used AA or AAA batteries out of their remote. They threw them away. That's what people were in the Roman Empire, slaves. The doulos, there are actually eight types of slaves in the Greek and Roman world, eight different types. Most of them are mentioned in the Bible. The very lowest of them, of all the slaves, just above bond slave, the even lower one, were the galley slaves. Those were real batteries. They, they paddled the boats, and as soon as they wouldn't paddle, they threw them overboard, and they became shark food or fish bait or whatever you want. They just, they just threw them overboard, and they drowned and died in the Mediterranean. And so it's interesting that Jesus talks about servants, because that's what Christians are. They're his slaves, we're his servants. But he said, there are some that are good, but then there are some that are evil. He didn't say bad, evil. And what that means is that they have a very bad ending. Look at, notice his stories. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, where else is that in the New Testament? What does that describe? Hell. So most of these stories are not between a good and a not good. It's between the have and the haves nots. It's between the saved and the lost. That's what's so interesting, especially when we get tomorrow morning. In the ten virgins, the five that are shut out, we'll see tomorrow morning. It, it has an equally awful ending. It says uh, that they will be uh, put out and they aren't, the door is shut and they say, Lord, open. He says, I don't know you. In fact, the, the worst thing that anybody could ever hear is Jesus saying, I never knew you. Because this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God. That's John 17, 3. So while we're waiting for Christ's coming, if we're his real servant, if we are truly born from above, we will be assured that his word is what we want to obey. We will be focused and not get distracted. We'll be watchful interesting word, Gregoreo. 
Do you remember what Jesus told the disciples on the Last Supper night when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That, that word Peter picks up when he says that we're supposed to watch out because our adversary, the devil, walks around what? Like a roaring lion seeking to devour us. We should be watchful. So this whole parable is about being watchful especially doing our job. One of the things I learned as, as a pastor, Paul mentioned for many, uh, whatever he said, uninterrupted years and all those things he read, is that there were so many pastors around me that wanted to be someone else. I mean, I had so many friends that wanted to be John Piper. I mean, they tried their hardest. To be, they wanted to be John MacArthur. They wanted, I, when I was younger, they wanted to be Jack Hiles, if you ever heard of him. Or they wanted to be, you know, Chuck Swindoll. Or who. It's interesting, none of them wanted to be them. They all wanted to be someone else. You find that in life. People, they want to look like someone else and act like someone else. Jesus said, no, no, I want you to do your job because you're created for good works, that salvation that nobody else can do. Isn't it exciting that I have something I'm called to do and, and gifted to do and, and expected to do that no one else can do? We're spiritual snowflakes. And God says, I don't want you to try and be someone else. I want you to be you. Uh, then tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about being prepared and examining our faith if we're even here and the Lord hasn't come, and it's going to be exciting. But do you remember what the most repeated part, the prophecy that I mentioned on the very first night when I did it twice on both sides? Do you remember what the most repeated warning Christ gave in the prophetic whole chapter? Not to be deceived? Well, tonight... Jesus wants us living as his good and faithful servants because he doesn't want us to be fooled. Do you know how the tribulation starts? The world is finally going to become peaceful and safe. Have you ever thought about that? That's Satan's entree. He is going to work his way up through this world. Now we know, we will see tonight, it says in Daniel chapter 9, we know where he comes from. He comes from the realm of the old Roman Empire. Now, that doesn't tell us very much. Why? Because one half of the Roman Empire was northern Africa and the Middle East. The other half was northern Europe, or western Europe, I mean, central and western. So what does the Roman Empire mean? Does it mean an Italian as much as it could mean a Syrian, or an Iraqi, or you know, someone from Algeria, because there were Roman emperors from all those places. And so when the Bible says that the last kingdom of this world is a revived Roman empire, we don't know if it's Christian or Muslim. Have you ever thought of that? What's the, the way that the Antichrist executes people? The same way ISIS does. You've seen any of those orange jumpsuit ISIS videos they used to show all the time where they were beheading people? That's what the Antichrist does. So it's interesting. We need to beware of global peace and the rise of the Antichrist. And Jesus warned us most that the Antichrist, if it was possible, would fool believers. But it's not possible. You know how we know that? Because Jesus told Peter, Satan wants to sift you, but I'm not going to let him. And the book of Jude that I quoted last service is, now unto him that is able to keep us from falling. Jesus keeps us and doesn't let us fall. So the, the greatest danger facing believers today is deception. So if we're supposed to, as, as Jesus told those good servants, not the evil ones, the evil ones were evil, the good ones were the ones that did what they were told to do. What did he tell us to do? Watch out for deception. Here's how Paul, uh, in his first letter to the first church he wrote to, the Thessalonians, or the second letter to the first church he wrote to, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, says this. Now, this is a very important verse. I have it up on the screen because it's so important, but this is one of those that if you're a highlighter, you should highlight. If you're an underliner, you should underline because there are some elements in it that a lot of people don't realize. It answers a lot of our questions. It says, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish... This is talking about the rise of the Antichrist. Because, now here's what salvation is. They did not receive the love of the truth. That's a description of a Christian. That's what God says characterizes a true believer. At salvation, it's not, what I did is I responded 
to the conviction and the working of the Holy Spirit and everything it says in John 6, 37 and 44 that, that happened. But when that happened, God gave me a new heart that loves the truth. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the what? The truth. What, yeah, and the life. But the, that center is truth. And we love him, so we love truth, and we have received the love of the truth that we might be saved. That's verse 10. Now look at verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them, that's the people that aren't truth lovers, that aren't saved, strong delusion. I just want to put a footnote in. When I was a teenager, one of the favorite tactics of the evangelists I used to sit under were they said, I'm preaching the gospel now. If you don't receive it and the Lord comes back, you'll never be able to be saved. Have you ever heard that? That anybody that heard the gospel before the rapture will not be able to be saved after. That's a, an amazing tool to make people respond today, but it's not in the Bible. That's, they take it from this passage. It doesn't say that. What it says is people that are not saved and become truth lovers, when they're not saved, they are going to be totally open to the delusion of Satan, and he's very powerful. He's the most powerful being God ever created. He's the smartest and most powerful being that God created in the universe. I mean, he's strong. Remember Michael, the leader of the host of the armies of the Lord? It says in Jude, Michael did not dare to stand up just on his own against Satan. He said, no, no. You can almost see him go like this, no, no. The Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to try. You're that powerful. Satan is unbelievably powerful, but he's nothing. He's just a creature God made. So they believe the lie, verse 11. Verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth. Again, that's what salvation is. But this is what an unsaved person is characterized by, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, you know, we still sin. But if we're a born-again Christian, we don't really have pleasure in it. It actually sickens us. That's one of the evidences of salvation. We hate sin. Why? Because truth and life and righteousness and God himself dwells in us, and we're his temple. So don't be deceived. Uh, the Antichrist is deceptive. And the Bible teaches, 1 John 2, uh, verse 18, and I just want to read that to you, 1 John 2, and verse 18, so, oop, one more page, it says this, da -da 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 -da. little children, it's the last hour, and as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it's the last hour. You notice there's the Antichrist, capital A, and in 1 John there are many Antichrists. Did you know there are many Antichrists? all over the place. I went to Michigan State University, Paul mentioned that. I was taught by an antichrist. You've all heard my story of my first class. How many of you have heard my first class at, at Michigan State story about the guy with his shirt open and his hairy chest and the, you all remember that one? Smoking the cigarette between the wrong two fingers, <laughs> wearing shorts that were way too short. That was my first professor. Do you know what he said as he blew smoke at us? Shows how old I am. At Michigan State, there were 600 of us in my freshman English class. This, that's what it was, first class. Blew at us, and he said, my goal in this class is to convince you of the mythology of Christianity, that the Bible is mythology. And he took another drag on his cigarette. And I was foolish enough. You know, they had us alphabetical in the old days when there were rules. The A's and B's started up in the top of the 600, and I just raised my hand. My mom told me, if you're in class at Michigan State and they do something that you need to ask about, raise your hand. I, I don't think anybody ever had raised their hand at Michigan State in a college class. <laughs> I raised my hand and he went, son, speak up. So I stood up and I said, the Bible is not mythology. And I sat right down. And you know, he spent the next, I mean, he wouldn't say a word to me. He just kept smoking and looking at me and kind of whatever. I don't know what he was glaring at me. After class, 50 of the 600 came to my corner and they said, can we start? 
a Bible study, we're Christians too. We know you are, but the professor didn't know we are. And we started a navigator group at Michigan State University working with the navigators from one antichrist uh, teaching. There are many antichrists. Chapter four, verse three of First John goes on. He says the same thing, and I need to read it to you uh, because First John is all about the coming of the antichrist. And it says in verse three, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist who you've heard was coming and now already is in the world. You see, Satan is permeating this world with his deception, with all religions and with the, the horrible, what we see, uh, the, the hatred of Israel. That's all behind uh, Satan's plan. But during the final days, most people will be led astray by evil spirits. You understand that? That's what it was like in Genesis, that every imagination and thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. The people were demonized, literally. And that's what the end is going to be like. So let's start talking about world events. I mentioned this in the opening. How does the global tech outage of July 19th point to the Antichrist? That's a great question. Those are the kind of questions we should be answering. Well, our whole world seems to need rescue. We have a very fragile global system. We learned that about the supply train, uh, chain during COVID. But the tech outage reminds us how quickly everything can shut down. The web. Uh, Bonnie and I were, uh, we were just coming from Canada, and we were pulled out of the line and put over under the awning. If you've ever traveled from Canada to America, that's bad. When they, when they come out, and they wear a bulletproof vests and have, you know, sidearms. And they go, and you go, what did I do? You know, and then they told me to get out of the car and to go in there. And so I left the family and went up there, and I, I went into a room, and I knew something was up. There were many people in the room, not one person was holding their phone. You know something's wrong then. You, you never see people without their phone. I mean, I think they scratch with it. They just have it in their hand. They can't. Kids sleep with them. You know, they don't want to miss anything, and they sleep with them. And so I went in, and, and I, of course, mine was in my pocket, and I wanted to take a picture of, they were confiscating a mum. We bought a mum in Canada, and that's smuggling to bring it into America, to buy a florist mum in a grocery store, it's, you can't do it. So I wanted to take a picture of it. And he said, don't take that phone out of your pocket. I went, oh. He said, you may not have cell phones in this area. I said, OK. If the World Wide Web went off, do you know what? People would go crazy. They would. They couldn't do their investments. They couldn't listen. They couldn't play games. They couldn't do anything. And so it's so important. The web, how about digital money? None of us ever thought we'd use all that stuff. And it's so convenient. You don't even have to touch. You just go near field, bing, and you didn't do a number. You didn't touch that dirty card. You didn't push any buttons. Public safety, I mean, our traffic lights. We went through part of, of Phoenix the day that it was out, and, and there were actual people going like this. It's really strange to watch that. The air travel stopped, communications. I mean, there was an AT&T outage because they used a little bit of that Microsoft program. Medical care, both, both procedures, dental, everything else. All at once happened. Now, now, what is that? Why does that even matter? Well, watch. One of the things Jesus said to look for is the growing birth pains. Uh, what starts small and is everyday normal grows to a crescendo. That's what the tribulation is. It's a crescendoing of normal things all at once. Well, we'll think about what happens. One person is going to control all the money, all the travel, and is going to promise security for everyone. He's going to be the master, the Antichrist, who's going to be the master diplomat. He allows the Muslims to allow the Jews both on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Do you know what all is going on right now? They're going to conquer back Jerusalem. That's, that's what Saddam Hussein was doing when he sent scuds. That's what's still going on. They want Jerusalem. What does the Bible say? 
in Revelation 13, no one can buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what that's saying is everything's going to get digitalized, and it is. All of our money is digitalized now. I mean, do you realize that paper money is going out? I mean, there are countries, whole countries, Norway, uh, Switzerland is trying to start that. Many other countries are digitalized. They don't want currency. That's all part of Satan's plan. First Thessalonians 5.3, for when they say peace and safety, by the way, that's the platform the Antichrist comes in on, sudden destruction will come upon them. So I'm going to, some of you might ask, when is this going to be? That's what the disciples ask, by the way. That was their opening question we started with uh, last night. When will all this happen? Well, let me show you. I teach the book of Revelation for 20 hours uh, in different college or Bible institutes around the country and, and in Europe. And I always take 20 hours, but I'll give you the whole 20 hours in two minutes. Here it is. This is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has seven beautiful pieces. By the way, the book of Revelation is a gift that God gave his son. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. So God the Father gave Christ this, what we're looking at right now, the next two minutes, as a gift to us. And you know what Revelation 1 says? That they might know the things that are going to rapidly happen. That's the opening verses of the book of Revelation. Uh, here's Revelation. Right now, we are the church on earth. That's what the first three chapters are about. The church on earth gets taken out with a word that's not in the Bible. If someone says to you, the rapture is not in the Bible, you say, oh, you're right about the word. The word rapture is not in the Bible. It's a Latin word. It's from the Vulgate. It was written by Jerome when he translated from the Greek and Hebrew, the Old and New Testament, into the Vulgate. He made a Latin word for the Greek word harpazo. Now, that's the Greek word. Rapture is harpazo. It sounds like harpoon. It is. It's when God harpoons. It's a quick pulling out is what harpazo means. Uh, by the way, Philip was raptured. Remember, he was with the Ethiopian eunuch, and all of a sudden he showed up in Azotus. He was pulled out and rapidly transported somewhere else. So the church is raptured. It's mentioned. You know, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place, and I'll come and receive you unto myself. Luke 24, he said, the same way I'm going to heaven, I'll come back. By the way, how did Jesus go to heaven? He was only seen by believers. Did you know that? After the resurrection, Jesus was only seen by believers. No, un no Roman soldier, no unbeliever, no Sadducee, no Pharisee. None of them saw him. He made it all over the Holy Land. He was never seen. But he was seen by the believers, and they stood there. And he went up, reigning. How did Jesus leave? It said he was blessing them. It was kind of like, you ever stood in a shower of really light rain? It just is so beautiful. Jesus was showering them with blessings as he was carried up out of their sight. And you know what the angel said? The same way he went, he's coming back just like that. That's, by the way, not the next time he's going to come back. I'll show you that in a minute. The church is in heaven. That's the next two chapters of Revelation 4 and 5. And then chapter 19 is a quick look at the church still in heaven. They're in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when the Bema seat, judgment, takes place. That's when we uh, give an account for our life. But now the tribulation, that's what we're looking at. That's when Satan's man is, is uh, deceiving the world. That's chapters 6 to 18, and that's the third event of the book of Revelation, culminated by the return of Christ. Do you know what it says in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? Jesus comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on his enemies. The world, flaming fire, totally different then I'm coming back the same way you see me coming, raining blessings. He's raining judgment. But he comes back to the earth as the king. Uh, chapter 20 is all about him ruling on earth. It says it six times in six verses. It's very interesting. Six times in Revelation 20, he said that he will come for a thousand years and 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 for a thousand years. I just said it six times. Now, what does that mean? Well, to half of Christendom, it doesn't mean a 1,000 years. It means something else. Even though it says it six times a 1,000 years, but that's what we call millennium, another word that's not in the Bible. That's another Latin word, mille, 1,000, annum. 
years. But Jesus rules for a thousand years. Why? Because a fourth of the Old Testament hasn't been fulfilled yet. And he said, I'm going to come back and do it. I'm going to come and sit on the throne of David and, and finally be the Messiah that I was promised to be. And he does. And immediately after that, almost every single person on earth rebels, except for the Christians that have all migrated to Jerusalem to live around the Millennial Temple. And there's the great white throne judgment. You've all heard, and I saw a throne. And they, it was, he that was seated on the throne, and the dead, small and great, were standing. And whoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast in the lake of fire. And then heaven. That's the seventh event, and it's chapter 21 and 22. So the book of Revelation, if you read it, has all these time stamps. It says, and then I saw, and then, and then I heard, and then I saw, and then I saw. And it reads like a, a reporter walking through, and it, it doesn't do any you know, backups. It's just amazingly going forward like this. And so those seven events. But how do we know they're really going to happen? Well, let's go back to Matthew 24, because I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, Matthew 24, look at verse 15, because Jesus said something very interesting. Uh, yesterday I told you that, or this morning, I mean, I told you that uh, Jesus authenticated Adam and Eve in chapter 19, and he authenticated Noah, but look who else he authenticates in chapter 24. Um, I was unloading my books in my library when I was pastoring in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was my very first day on the job. And I had all my books there, and, and I was trying to get them in order, you know, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the books of the Old Testament, my commentaries. And my secretary uh, that I just had met, she says, oh, by the way, the phone just rang, and it's for you. I said, oh, great. I couldn't find the phone. She said, before you answer it, she said, it's John Erling. And I said, is he a member? She said, oh. She said he has the largest radio show in Tulsa, 500,000 people in his radio audience, you know, out of the million in the metro area. She said he's the most listened to person in Tulsa. And every time a new pastor comes on their first day, he calls them and asks them a question. On the air right now, she said, and it's you. I said, wonderful. And guess what I grabbed? Because I knew it was going to ask me something about the Bible. So I grabbed my Bible. And I picked up the phone. I said, oh, John Barnett here? He said, John Erling here. And just want to let you know that you know, all of Tulsa is listening to you. And he says, we also have, and he named the two mega church pastors in town, the giant United Methodist downtown and the giant United something else downtown, who did not believe in the deity of Christ or the inspiration of scripture or anything, hardly. And, and he said, we're all three on the line to welcome you to Tulsa. And we have one question for you we've been talking about on the air. And you missed it, so we'll tell you what it is. And I said, what is it? He said, we're talking about the fact that my esteemed guests, these other two pastors, believe that no one is historic in the Bible before David, and we're not even sure David existed, but certainly no one mentioned before. That means Noah, Abraham, all those people are, are not historic personages. They're kind of made up people. And he said, and so we'll be back right after the break, and we'd like to hear from you how you know those people are real. And he went off to a commercial break. And so I just opened up to chapter 19 of Matthew, and when the break was over, 30 seconds later, he said, Dow, do you have an answer? I said, yes. I said, I can say it in one sentence. He said, one sentence? I said, less than a sentence. I said, the, I believe the Bible is true, and all those people are true, because Jesus did. And there was this long, yeah, I mean, certainly those two pastors weren't going to say they didn't believe in Jesus. You know, they would have lost their jobs. <laughs> and John Erling was Jewish, and so I don't know what he was going to do. And he said, this could did you just say that you believe the Bible is true because Jesus believed the Bible is true? He says, how did you know Jesus believed the Bible is true? And he says, we're coming back after another commercial break, and, and we would like to hear from you how you know Jesus, what Jesus knew. And I couldn't wait for the next 20 minutes. And slowly, the, the esteemed guest pastors all said, we have to go, we have to go. They didn't want to be associated with this. Jesus authenticates the Bible. He believed in a real Adam, a real Eve, a real creation, a real flood, a real Garden of Eden. He believes in all that stuff. But he also believes the other end. Because the book of Revelation is from him to us. 
so that we know what's going to happen. So look what he says in verse 15 of chapter 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, Jesus authenticates one of the most contested Old Testament books. Daniel is not believed to be accurate by any liberal person that studies the Bible. They just said it's impossible. He could have known all those things that were happening. Nobody could know the future like Daniel predicts. Daniel the prophet, verse 15, standing in the holy place. What is that? Well, there are two words for the temple. There's hitaron, which means temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then there's naos, which is the holy of holies. That's where, that's the other word. He's standing in the holy of holies. Whoever reads this, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop. What is he saying? Well, number one, Jesus authentic. I mean, if you just back up and doing, you know, normal Bible study, you'd say, what observations can we make? Well, the first one is Jesus believed Daniel. This is the only Old Testament prophecy person that Jesus quotes. So I say Daniel was Jesus' favorite Old Testament prophecy writer. So, so Jesus authenticates Daniel. Now, what does he say? Well, Matthew 24, 15 is one of the 11 things the book of Revelation. If I was teaching Revelation, I'd go through all of them. Revelation's picture of what earth looks like at Christ's return. Revelation is kind of like a drone view of what's going on on earth before Jesus returns. So is Matthew 24. It's like a landing shot that, if you've ever seen one of those, where the drone's coming down and everything gets clearer and clearer and clearer, and finally you see it all. That's what Matthew 24 is. What, what does Jesus say the world is like? Deception. We're covering that right now. Lawlessness, war, murder. Remember, he's talking about all the killing. That's Revelation 6 and 9. Food scarcity. There's going to be starvation. Water scarcity. Revelation says people are going to be dying because they don't have any water to drink. Pandemics. I mean, we just had one, only we're having a, one with high lethality. I mean, COVID killed whatever, point something percent. Uh, Monkeypox that's now bothering some areas is, is higher. But in the time of the tribulation, the lethality rate is a fourth. One in every four people die of the pandemics. And so we're talking about, instead of thousands and millions, we're talking about billions. Then there are earthquakes and seismic activity. Then there's hatred of God and persecution, uh, Matthew 24, 9. Uh, we read that yesterday. They will deliver you up to tribulation. They will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. That's a characteristic of the tribulation. But look at number seven. The rise of the dragon, beast, and prophet. The dragon, that's Satan, chapter 12. The beast, that's Satan's Messiah, the Antichrist. The prophet is his front man. Do you know what he can do? You know what it says he does? He can call down fire from heaven. Wouldn't that be convincing? Can you imagine someone that could actually say, watch, and they burn someone up in their car. They call down fire from heaven. Kind of like Elijah did. Only a false prophet, an emissary of Satan, can call down fire. That's not all. It says he can do signs and wonders. He even brings back the Antichrist after he has a mortal wound. He brings him back and the world wonders after him. So that's what we're looking at tonight, the rise of the dragon, the beast, and the prophet. That's verse 15, because we see him in verse 15, standing in the holy place. So, and then the rest you can read. But what, what does verse 15 really say? That there's going to be a third temple. Remember I told you there was the first temple of Solomon? And then there was the, the Zerubbabel temple that started, you know, and then Herod, so 2A and 2B, was the one that Jesus was in. But this is the third one. In fact, there is a future Jewish temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation, and Daniel saw it in verse 27 of chapter 9. That's what Jesus was quoting. Jesus quotes what Daniel said was going to happen. Jesus affirms it. Jesus saw it. He said that this abomination that causes desolation is going to be in the holy place. Paul saw it. That's what 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says. And I, I read to you the passage that was just before that, but 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says this, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. That's what the Antichrist does. And Paul told the first the, the first group he wrote an epistle to, he's covering prophetic details that 80% of all churches in America avoid. Does that bother us at all? Do you know why they avoid it? Same reason Martin Luther and John Calvin avoided it. They said it's too confusing. They, they, didn't want, they could not compute. The reformers could not compute how the Jews fit in. Why? Because of St. Augustine. St. Augustine or Augustine, you've heard of him. He's the one that actually, Calvin just codified Augustinianism. Calvinism, we call it today, is Augustinianism. It's all from St. Augustine. He's the one that wrote all that stuff, and Calvin just put it into the Institutes. But do you know what, Cal what Augustine said? He said, we're not waiting for some future kingdom in the Jews to do this. The kingdom of God, his book was called Civite Dei, the city of God. He said, it's here. And that's what the Byzantine emperor of Rome was about. The whole Byzantine empire was building cathedrals that were just unbelievably huge because they were Christianizing the world physically with cathedrals and conquest. And it, that, the whole thing of replacement theology all goes back there. But Paul taught the truth about that. And then John sees it in Revelation 11.1. 1. He, he says that an angel comes and measures during the tribulation this temple. So the first temple was Solomon's, 970 to 950. The second temple was Herod's. Remember, uh, they said 40 and 3 years has this been built and it's not finished yet during Jesus' time. It took a long time. Then there's the third temple. That's in Revelation 11. But there's another one. From Ezekiel 40 to 48, there is the longest stretch you've ever read. And if you read through the Bible, it's hard to read all that stuff. And it talks about a literal visitor center that is, a, a, it's huge. I mean, it's 25,000 cubits. Do you know how long 25,000 cubits is? It's 37,500 feet. You know what that is? Seven miles. The temple is seven miles by seven miles, the courtyard of it. It's 50 square miles. What's it for? Ezekiel says the whole world has to come through God's temple during the millennium. And they come through and they hear the gospel. And if they won't come, it won't rain on their crops. So they're forced to come by God, or else their crops won't grow and they'll have problems. And they hear about Christ. And Revelation 20 says, after a thousand years of hearing about Christ and seeing him in person, they reject him. That's how hard the human heart is. It's drastic. Well, what does the Antichrist do? Uh, how might the Antichrist solve the global Israel challenge? Well, there's room for all three monotheistic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Did you know right now in, in Dubai, they have this thing started. They have a gigantic mosque, and next to it they have a Christian church, Roman Catholic, and they have a Jewish synagogue. A mosque, a synagogue, and a cathedral side by side to show global peace. Our current pope, is signed on with this. And he has, in Assisi, a similar setup. Only he's add, added Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and everything else. And he, in Assisi, has a peace garden. Uh, when Bonnie and I were teaching uh, Romans and Galatians, we, we did a student field trip to walk through the Pope's peace garden for global peace. But there is room in Jerusalem. You can see the Dome of the Rock right there in the middle. You see Al-Aqsa over on the left. See the space between the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa? There's room. Could be a Christian church there. Probably the temple of the Jews has to be to the right of the Dome of the Rock. Why? Because when Josephus, the traitor Jew helping the Romans conquer Jerusalem, he was on the Mount of Olives, and he in his, the, the writings of Josephus looked down, and he could see through the eastern gate, and he said he could see the holy place through the eastern gate. You know what that means? That the, that space right there, see on the right, the temple must line up with the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate. That's what's very hard to see right there. 
probably the Jewish temple will go there. That's why Revelation 11 says, you know, measure the temple, but outside don't because it's defiled and trampled by the, the Gentiles. It's because it's a mosque and whatever else is there. So Jesus affirms for us what Daniel said. What did Daniel say? There are four world empires. Not that there have only been four, but there are four that figure into the biblical narrative. The Antichrist is going to rise from the fourth, and the real Christ, Jesus, is going to come. Now, you remember Daniel, another Sunday school picture? Uh, in Daniel 2, he saw the image that Nebuchadnezzar made, head of gold, you know, the chest and arms down to the waist of silver, and then from the waist down to the thighs of brass, and then from the thighs down, iron, and by the time we get to the feet, it's iron and clay mixed. You remember that? That's how humanity looks at the world empires. Gold and silver, brass, you know, strong. Then Daniel 7 is how God looks at humanity. He sees ravenous animals. Remember, that's how humanity is. We're rapacious. A winged lion, a bear on his side, a leopard, a terrible beast. It's describing the same configuration of successive empires. What are they? Babylon. Babylon wasn't the first empire. The Egyptians were around before them. The Assyrians were around before them. The Akkadians were around before them. But Babylon is the first one that starts the countdown to the end. It was the first empire in God's for empire scenario. Then Persia follows them, then Greece follows them, then Rome, and then a second Rome. You say, where do you give that? Well, I'm glad you keep asking. Those questions you're asking are very good. Where does it say that? Well, Jesus gave a simple map, a map of the future. It's flawless, it's accurate. It's a guide for us to understand history. When Bonnie and I had all eight of our children in the car, do you know what they always ask? As soon as I turn the car on, where are we going? About two minutes later, when will we be there? That was a perpetual question. God knows we all want to know that. So he's given us a map. So we know what happened and why in the past, what's going on in the present, and what will happen in the future. And when God Almighty rules from heaven, he gave Daniel a snapshot. And here we go. I just I took a picture of my Bible so you can see what I'm talking about. So turn to Daniel 9 just before we go. This one's over at 8 or 8.10. You didn't tell me. Okay, good. Well, it's really close to eight right now. <laughs> Look at this. This is Daniel's prayer. And by the way, this is considered by most prophecy people the most powerful prophecy in the whole Bible by the time we get to the last three verses, okay? Uh, if you've ever heard of the Acts, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication prayer model, you ever gone to a concert prayer? It comes from Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and, and I could go through that. But why I underline that is Daniel says in the first year of his reign, that's Darius or Cyrus, uh, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. Where is that? Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12. That God would accomplish 70 years of desolations in Jerusalem. Do you know what that verse says? Daniel did a Bible study. He read the prophet Jeremiah and he took him literally. Did you know every time anybody in the Bible reads the Bible and considers any prophecy, they don't take it figuratively. They believe it means what it literally says. Jeremiah says 70 years are determined. Daniel said, I believe it. And he started praying. So, but here's the prophecy, and then we'll go. Verse 26. After 60 and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement. That's Christ being crucified. And the people, now this is the most important line. The people of the prince who is to come. That's one of the 30 different names of the Antichrist. He's called the lawless one. He's called the son of perdition, you know, and, and Judas is called that too, but it's because Satan entered Judas and Satan enters the Antichrist. But another one of his names is the prince who is going to come. Who is this prince that's going to come? He shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood till the time and end of the wars of desolations are determined. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. There is the only place that we find the seven-year tribulation. You ever heard of the seven-year tribulation? But you can't find it in the Bible. Well, it's right here. It's a heptad. It's a seven. 
And it says, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. So this future prince is going to come. Who is he? Well, he happens to be the one that is the people that destroyed Jerusalem, that's the Romans, that crucified Christ, that's the Romans. But he's going to be a future edition of that. So, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Here's the 70th week of Daniel. 69 weeks went up to the crucifixion, then the temple was destroyed, and, and there's a gap between the 69 weeks and the 70th week. The last week is seven years. It's when the Antichrist makes a covenant, in the middle of it, he defiles, that's what Jesus said, the the abomination that causes desolation, and there are two halves, the first three and a half and the second three and a half. And then Revelation divides it further. It talks about it being 42 months and 42 months, and another time it talks about it being 1,260 days and 1,260 days, but it's the two halves. And you say, well, what is all that? Well, if you overlap that with other things in the Bible, there is an invasion by the Magog invasion the only thing we don't know from the Bible is, does that happen before the rapture? Or is that the same thing as the Battle of Armageddon? Most scholars are divided on that. The temple being rebuilt has to be rebuilt somewhere because by the middle of that week, the Antichrist defiles it and wants to be worshipped, puts up his image. Well, the conclusion is the Antichrist is the worst human that ever lives. He's the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's the false Christ. He's the Jesus everybody wanted because they didn't like the real one. What's the only protection? This is what I share with the students. How do you escape the mark of the beast? Boy, that is a hot topic, especially for those that think they're going to go through the tribulation. How do you escape the mark of the beast? The only protection is God's signature. How does God sign our life? Well, he forgives us, he justifies us, he regenerates us, he reconciles us, he adopts us into his family. He redeems us, and he starts a lifelong process of sanctification. We are supposed to be doing our job, watching and resisting being deceived. I just have to show this before you go have your cookies. Bonnie and I are full-time globe-circling missionaries that teach 20-year-olds all over the world. Someone said to me, you don't look old. I said, I feel really old, but we're around 20-year-olds all the time, and it does something to you to be with college kids. That's our prayer card. We, we go from North Africa to the Middle East, Central Europe, and we're going to do that and end up in Japan by Thanksgiving. After we leave here, we just start and go around and teach. But if you haven't ever adopted a missionary that you pray for and you put them up on your refrigerator, that QR code is... Uh, electronic copy of our prayer card. We'd love to have you pray for us. In fact, one of our dear supporters grabbed me in the aisle, put his arms around me, and prayed over me in the aisle, and, and prayed a whole year of prayers of blessing. That, that was a blessing to me, because that's what we feel when people uh, pray for us. Then the last thing I want to show you is Google hosts every class I've ever taught at every church I've ever pastored, they host all of them for free. And if you ever want, like someone said to me, I have a problem with you, you went too fast, and you changed the slides. I said, well, it's all on YouTube. You can get it there. And, and it's right there. And that's the QR code to YouTube. And if you really like classes in order, this is every class we've ever taught in every Bible Institute, and it's called the DTBM Academy. DTBMA. And it's just listed. There's the whole book of Revelation. There's the most popular, the one with yellow is the most popular course we have. It's called The 52 Greatest Chapters. It's spending one year covering every attribute of God, every doctrine of theology, and covering the 52 chapters that summarize everything the Bible says. It's a fascinating year. And uh, it's right there, and there's lots of other courses. And I say all that because it's time to go, because the cookies are getting cold. So let's bow for a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Dear Father, I pray that we would be watchful, that we would do our job. Now, the first job you told us is not to be deceived, and as we're not deceived, we do live for you, and we live for you against the flow of this world, which is flowing away from you faster and faster, and away from truth, and away from holiness, and righteousness, and compassion, and I pray that 
you would keep us from being deceived by the errors of the evil one who wants to make everyone evil and that we would shine as lights in this dark world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.